Uh, thanks for coming out to hear me talk about Russia. Um, you don't really hear about Russia much in the news these days, so I figured uh, we'd, we'd start off with something like that. Uh, the talk today is called The Great Game, and it's about the relationship between Russia and the West, really from the late 18th to the early 20th century. So we're going to be talking about roughly 120 or so years of history, 125 years of history, and the relationship between Imperial Russia and the rest of Europe. Now, um, when we think of Russia today, um, it's important to remember that Russia is kind of, it spans two continents and two kind of cultures. The western part of Russia, the European part of Russia, uh, where Moscow and St. Petersburg and all the big cities are, was very much involved in European politics by the end of the 19th, uh, by the end of the 18th century. Um, really, beginning at the the early 18th century with Peter the Great, who was the Tsar of Russia, the Russia's, Russians begin looking westward and interacting more with Western Europe. For a long time, Russia was relatively isolated. It had developed its own culture, its own religion, um, Eastern Orthodoxy, Russian Orthodoxy, and was separate from everything else that was going on in Europe. Peter the Great, however, changes that. He wants to be involved in European affairs. He wants to modernize and westernize Russia. And that causes a tremendous amount of controversy in Russia that we won't get into today. But by the end of the 18th century, Russia was very much a Western European country in terms of its military structure, uh, it, much of its political ideology, all of that sort of stuff, Russia was involved in Europe. So this map kind of gives a quick overview of the growth of Russia from the 16th century to the late 19th century. The origins of the Russian state as we, as we know it were this area over here, the area around Moscow going up to St. Petersburg, uh, St. Petersburg Archangel over here, basically west of the Ural Mountains. But over the course of the 16th, 17th, and 18th century, Russia undergoes a dramatic expansion, expanding eastward all the way across Siberia. Um, if you want kind of a historical analogy for Russian expansion across Siberia, it's very much akin to American expansion across North America. Uh, there were native peoples that lived here, but the Russians, with their... Um, military power and their political power, subdue all of those people and establish Russian dominance over this gigantic, vast area. Uh, the Russians also begin pushing southward into uh, areas around the, the Caspian Sea and the Aral Sea over here, uh, expanding their territory, expanding the area in which they have influence. And of course, they also continue pushing westward, uh, conquering places like the Ukraine. Uh, so from the 16th century through the 19th century, Russia was in a constant state of expansion. Now, if you're expanding, you're expanding into places where there are already other people or other states or other civilizations. And that sometimes leads to conflict. And a lot of what we're gonna be talking about today is that conflict between Russia and other powerful established empires. Not so much this way, although the Russians do have some conflict with the Chinese over control and influence in Central Asia. We're going to be looking more this way and a little bit this way. Uh, so southwest and west as Russia expands, as Russia grows. And we pick up our story. Mute that. With Catherine the Great. Catherine the Great was the ruler of Russia in the latter part of the 18th century. How many of you have heard of Catherine the Great? What do you know about her? She was German. She was German. She wasn't even Russian. She was a German princess who was um, selected to marry the heir to the Russian throne, uh, the Tsar Peter III. So Catherine, a young German princess, taken away from Germany, brought to Russia, uh, forced to convert to Russian Orthodox, or, or Orthodoxy, uh, changes her name to the 
Russian version of Catherine Ekaterina, and marries the heir to the throne. Um, everybody lives happily ever after, right? We just saw a royal wedding this past weekend, and everything was great. No, in fact, it doesn't happen. Uh, Catherine and her husband don't like each other. In fact, they almost despise each other. And soon, uh, young, attractive Catherine's attentions are being drawn by others. Uh, you know, dashing cavalry officers and that sort of thing. She begins to have many relations with other men beside her husband. And she really doesn't like her husband. And, and for a matter of fact, most of the Russian establishment doesn't like her husband. They think of him as an incompetent and not really fit to rule. So, what happens? Catherine essentially organizes a coup d'etat, overthrowing her husband and claiming the throne herself. Uh, her husband ends up in prison where he mysteriously dies. Oops. Uh, and Catherine, a German princess, is now the ruler of Russia. She wasn't Russian, but she <laughs> acquires the Russian imperial throne. Now, Catherine the Great is a, a significant figure in the story we're telling because she really begins the push for Russia getting more deeply involved in events in Europe. Mm -hmm. But she's also spending a lot of her time uh, competing with another territorial rival, a little bit to the southwest the Ottoman Empire, the Ottoman Turks. Uh, in fact, what we see is that for the better part of 200 years, Russia and the Ottoman Empire are going to war. They are constantly fighting against each other. Here's just a brief list of some of the Russo-Turkish wars. Uh, the, so the Russo-Turkish War of 1768, the Russo-Turkish War of 1787, Russo-Turkish War of 1806, the Russo-Turkish War of 1828, the Crimean War, the Russo-Turkish War of 1877, and we could probably throw World War I on there, because really, who was one of the people, one of the nations Russia was fighting against? The Ottoman Empire. So the Russians and the Turks don't get along. And they don't get along because they have competing territorial interests. Uh, if you want to kind of draw a, a straight line picture. The Ottoman Empire controlled the area south of the Black Sea, south of the Caspian Sea. The Russians controlled the territory north of the Black Sea and north of the Caspian Sea. Where they abutted, they were constantly in competition. The Russians wanted to expand. The Ottomans wanted to expand. That led to constant conflict, as we see here on this list. But since we were talking about Catherine the Great, what we're going to look at is the first Russo-Turkish war on this list, which was actually the fourth or fifth Russo-Turkish war, but the first one on our list. Why is that one significant? Because it is during this Russo-Turkish war that uh, Russia backs a, a territory in the Ottoman Empire that is trying to break free from the Ottoman Empire. The area of the Crimean. Again, something we don't hear about much in the news anymore, the Crimean. Uh, the Crimean Peninsula is right here, the Azov Sea, the Black Sea is right there. Basically, the ruler of the Crimea, the Khan of the Crimea, wanted more power, wanted more authority in his territory, didn't want to be part of the Ottoman Empire, rebels against the Ottoman Empire, and Catherine the Great says, here, we'll help you out. And with Russian backing, the Khanate of the Crimea gains its independence. A short-lived independence, because within a couple of years, the Russians absorb it into the Russian Empire. And Russia now has all of this territory that's uh, striped with yellow. That becomes part of the Russian Empire. Now, why is this significant for greater Russian imperial aims? One of the things that Russia lacks is a warm water seaport. Most of the Russian coastline in the Pacific and in the Baltic Sea would freeze up in the wintertime. That's not good for trade. It's not good for the uh, expression of military power. So the Russians, since Peter the Great had desired a warm water seaport, well, guess what they just acquired over here? Warm water seaports. They now had access to the Black Sea from the Black Sea to the Mediterranean. Of course, to get to the Mediterranean, they had to sail through Turkish territory. 
past Constantinople through the Dardanelles to get out into the Mediterranean. So we have another source of tension between the Russians and the Turks there. Uh, this image over here is a celebration of the Russian victory in this Russo-Turkish war. While Catherine is expanding her empire southward to the coast of the Black Sea, she is also getting involved in events in Eastern Europe. Particularly in Poland. In the 17th century, Poland was one of the most powerful states in Europe. Uh, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth controlled territory from up here to the Baltic Sea, pretty much down into Central Europe. It was the Poles, the Polish-Lithuanian army, that saved Vienna from the Ottoman Turks in the middle of the 17th century. End of the 17th century. Poland was a powerful political military entity. But by the end of the 18th century, Poland ceases to exist on the map of Europe. Why? Because of the growing influence of Poland's neighbors. Russia to the east, Prussia to the west, and Austria to the south. Th those three states begin to expand their influence, their power. And it was Poland that suffered. It was Poland that began to lose territory. At the end of the, 19th, uh, the, end of the 18th century, Poland is divided up three times. It loses territory. The first time in 1772, Russia, Prussia, and Austria grab Polish territory. Uh, 20 years later, 1793, Russia and Prussia gain more territory in what was once Poland. And two years after that, in 1795, Austria, Russia, Prussia conspire to divide Poland among them. Poland ceases to exist on the map of Europe. And that will be the situation until 1919. Over the entire course of the 19th century, there is no Poland. Poland does not exist on the map. Now, the Poles exist, a Polish culture, the Polish people are still there, but they are dominated by these foreign powers. So, Catherine was very much a player in this division of Poland, extending Russian influence, Russian territory, all the way to here. Uh, the Prussians grab that, the Austrians grab this, Poland ceases to exist. So we can see that um, Russia is expanding, and that expansion of Russia begins to put pressure on other states, on other entities. Now, when Catherine finally dies, um, oh, she's succeeded by her son, Paul, who becomes the Tsar of Russia. Uh, Paul was perhaps mentally challenged. Uh, he was not a smart person, not really fit for rule. And in fact, he only remains czar for about five years. In 1801, he is forcibly removed from the throne uh, because he is for lack of a better term, an idiot, um, in many different ways. Uh, was he the legitimate heir to the Russian throne? Perhaps. He was Catherine's son, but was Catherine the legitimate ruler of Russia? Technically not. But uh, her, her successor does become the czar. Now, one of the important things that does happen during Paul's reign is that in France, the French Revolution is uh, becoming more violent, is becoming more bloody, and we see the French Revolutionary Wars beginning to spread across Europe. In 1799, the French Revolutionary Wars kind of change, and they become the Napoleonic Wars, because Napoleon becomes the head guy in France. He essentially takes control of France and is ruling that country as a dictator. Uh, and he is constantly fighting against other European powers. The Napoleonic Wars will have a dramatic impact on Russia because Napoleon fights everywhere. He conquers much of Europe, subdues much of Europe, defeating many of the armies that are sent against him. And when Paul is removed from the throne, he's succeeded by a new czar, Alexander I. 
Alexander is a young man, um, and he is in awe of what Napoleon is doing. Now, politically, in terms of the imperial uh, relationship, Russia and France are at odds against each other, but the Ru young Russian Tsar admires the ruler of France, and when Napoleon crowns himself Emperor of France, Alexander kind of thinks, wow, you know, look at him, he has all this power, he has all this glory. Uh, I mean, the Russian Tsar isn't a, a low glory position, right? But it, he was marveling at what Napoleon was doing. So there was a, a sense of admiration, a, a sense of uh, idolizing Napoleon coming from the Russian Tsar. But the Russia was still at war with Napoleon. So you have this back and forth, this kind of uh, duality going on there in the, the figure of the Russian Tsar. Well, what happens? In the early 19th century, Napoleon is waging war and usually winning a lot of those wars, winning a lot of those battles, including uh, the Battle of Austerlitz in 1805. At the Battle of Austerlitz, Napoleon uh, defeats a combined Prussian, Austrian, and Russian army. He, it, Austerlitz is widely considered one of Napoleon's great victories because he defeats a much larger military force through superior tactics, superior uh, generalship. After Austerlitz, Napoleon seems to be supreme. He seems to be in, unbeatable. Um, and the Russian Tsar, Alexander, is still kind of like, wow, you know, like... Um, if you were to run into Michael Jordan while you were playing pickup basketball in the park, right? You'd be like, wow, because he, he can do everything. Uh, so there was this, this very much aura of invincibility around Napoleon that Alexander wanted to be a part of. And in fact, the victory at Austerlitz led to diplomacy between France and Russia. And in 1807, Napoleon the Emperor of France, and Alexander, the Tsar of Russia, meet on a barge in the river near Tilsit in Germany and sign a treaty. Sign, they form an alliance. The young Tsar is now tied up to his idol, the Emperor of France. <coughs> this is really the high point of Napoleon's power because now he really is supreme in Europe. He controls France, he controls Italy, he has subdued the German states, he has uh, married into the Austrian imperial family, and now he has the Tsar of Russia as his ally. Napoleon controls the continent. Who's the only country that really is still fighting against Napoleon? The British. Uh, and it is that fact that the British remain aloof, remain independent from Napoleon, that will eventually uh, cause a fracture in the relationship between the Tsar and the Emperor. Now, one of Napoleon's strategies was to close off all of Europe from British goods. Britain was the leading trading power. So Napoleon says, we're not going to take goods from Britain, which worked out okay because Britain was blockading continental Europe anyway, so they weren't letting any trade goods go. Now, that's fine at first. This continental system that Napoleon imposes works okay, except that Russia begins to kind of chafe at this. The Russian Tsar doesn't like being treated as a junior partner, doesn't like being treated as the kid in the relationship. The, he's the Tsar of Russia. You know, I am a hereditary ruler of a vast empire. You, France, you, Napoleon, are an upstart. You're Corsican, you're not even French, right? So there's a beginning of a fraying in the relationship. So much so that by 1810, Alexander basically begins to ignore Napoleon and begins trading with Britain and begins dismantling Napoleon's continental system. And that angers Napoleon. Now, in 1812, Europe looked very much like this. This area with the red outline was controlled by Napoleon, even though there was an Austrian emperor and kings of Prussia and all of that. Napoleon was the dominant power. He was the dominant political figure. He made alliances through politics, through marriage, by defeating his enemies on the battlefield. But Russia has now broken away from France's hold, has now broken away from that treaty. And Napoleon 
says, well, I'm going to teach Russia a lesson. I'm going to teach the czar that he shouldn't mess with me. So what does Napoleon do in 1812? He invades Russia. Now, Napoleon's strategy seemed somewhat sound. What he planned was to gather up his Grand Armée, half a million men, and march into Russia and kind of approach Moscow, the traditional capital of Russia. And Napoleon figured, well, if I invade Russia with this giant army, Alexander and the Russians will have to come out to face me, to defend Russia. And Napoleon was sure that his French imperial army and his generalship could defeat the Russians on the field of battle. So he sets off eastward with this giant French army. He actually stops at the border of Russia, expecting the Russians to come out. The Russians don't. So Napoleon says, okay, and he marches into Russia, and he begins heading right toward Moscow. And as he advances, he encounters nobody. The Russian czar, the Russian military is not there. They don't come out to confront Napoleon. So he goes further and further and further into Russia, going deeper and deeper and deeper into enemy territory and further and further away from his line of supply. As Napoleon approaches Moscow, the Russians do come out to face him in one battle, the Battle of Borodino over here, which is a French victory. The Russians retreat. Napoleon thinks, great, I've won, now Russia will have to, to concede to my demands. But they don't. So Napoleon begins marching on Moscow. And what do the Russians do? They burn Moscow to the ground. Much of the city is destroyed. The Russians are essentially uh, using scorched earth tactics to thwart Napoleon's advance. Napoleon captures Moscow sets up shop in the Kremlin, and waits for Alexander to send him a note of surrender. It never comes. But what does happen? Winter. 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 The winter of 1812 is one of the coldest Russian winters in history. And here you have Napoleon's Grand Armée, hundreds of miles behind enemy lines, short on supplies, caught in a Russian winter. Napoleon realizes he can't maintain his position, he can't maintain his army in Russia, and slowly begins a long, painful, agonizing retreat back to France. By the time Napoleon and his army make it back to France, half his troops are dead. Either in battle, from disease and starvation in Russia, many of them uh, drown when they are crossing a river in Lithuania, when the ice cracks and they all sink into the, uh, the the frozen river. Um, the invasion of Russia was Napoleon's biggest strategic mistake. It was unsuccessful. And in fact, it hastened the decline of his empire. Within two years, Napoleon would abdicate for the first time in 1814. He does come back in 1815, uh, scaring all of the crowned heads of Europe, but he is defeated in 1815 at Waterloo and sent once again into an exile. Uh, he dies in exile in 1821. Now, of the Napoleonic invasion of France, Alexander I's strategy was basically, well, we're just gonna keep retreating. They can't follow us all the way into Russia. Russia is very big. Um, and famously, he says something on, along the lines of the only generals on whom the Russians can count are generals January and February. The Russian winter will stop any, uh, any invasion. Of course, what happens 120 years later? World War II, the Germans invade Russia, and what stops the German advance? The Russian winter. Um, so, Napoleon invades Russia in 1812. It fails, it leads to his downfall. So what are we gonna do now? Napoleon's gone. How are we going to figure out what the map of Europe looks like? Well, have no fear, because the crowned heads and the diplomats of Europe have a plan. They all gather in Vienna at this event called the Congress of Vienna, which actually begins in 1814, gets disrupted when Napoleon comes out of exile, and then reconvenes in 1815. What the Congress of Vienna was doing, was going to do, was remake the map of Europe. This was a 
gathering of conservative leaders. They wanted to try to erase the damage of the Napoleonic Wars, erase the damage of the French Revolution. One of the first things they do is they um, dismantle Napoleon's empire. They take the brother of the executed French king, Louis XVI, put him on the throne of France as King Louis XVIII. They reestablish the monarchy in France, and then they redraw all the borders in Europe. They increase the territory of Russia, increase the territory of Austria, create this thing called the German Confederation, break Italy back up into its many constituent pieces. They essentially try to redraw, recreate how Europe looked before the French Revolution. Um, the Congress of Vienna is largely successful in what it does. Because one of, the main, one of its main goals was to ensure peace in Europe. They didn't want to see another Napoleon arise somewhere who could dominate the entire continent. They established this notion of the balance of power. That no one European state should be so powerful as to dominate the rest. And for about a hundred years, the Congress of Vienna is able to maintain a semblance of peace in Europe. Uh, the 19th century, though there are wars that do break out, is largely a peaceful time in Europe itself because of the, uh, the, the plans put in place at the Congress of Vienna. Now, one of the things that the Napoleonic Wars does do is that it begins to um, excite the idea of nationalism in Europe. It gives rise to the idea that, you know, if we are Italian, maybe we should have an Italian state. Or if we are German, maybe we should have a German state. Or if we are Polish, maybe we should have a Polish state. The Poles really want to have a, a, a Polish state. It takes them a while before they get it. There is this rise of ethnic nationalism in Europe where people want to have their own nation. They want to have these ethnically dominated states. The first place where we really see this emerging successfully is down over here in the Ottoman Empire in Greece. Greece was part of the Ottoman Empire. It had been conquered uh, probably in the 16th century by the Ottoman Turks. By the time we get to the Napoleonic Wars, however, there is a sentiment among the Greeks that we should be independent, that we should have our own Greek state. The Greeks were different than the Ottoman Turks. They didn't want to be dominated by the Ottoman Turks. Uh, one of the main differences was religion. The Greeks were Eastern Orthodox. The Ottomans were Muslim. Uh, the Greeks spoke Greek. They had a heritage going back to ancient Athens and Sparta, all the way back. Uh, the Ottoman Turks didn't. The Greeks had a sense of Greekness. I don't know if that's a word, but we'll use it anyway. Uh, so what we see happening is that by the early 1820s, the Greeks begin to agitate for independence and begin to revolt against the Ottoman Turks. Now, the Ottoman Turks, for their part, don't want Greece to be independent. Why would they want to lose this province of their empire? So a revolution breaks out. The Greek War of Independence, the Greek Revolution, however you want to term it. Uh, and it becomes a almost fanatical war. The Greeks uh, fighting to create a Greek state almost has a, a crusader aspect to it a religious, quasi-sacred uh, 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 sa uh, effort in establishing Greek independence. The Ottoman Turks want to crush this rebellion, want to put it down. And what emerges during this Greek War of Independence is incredibly, an incredibly bloody and brutal struggle. Massacres on both sides. The Turks massacring Greek civilians, such as here at the Massacre at Chios, which is uh, by the uh, French, depicted by the French artist uh, Eugene Delacroix. Uh, the Greeks attacking the Turks. There is sectarian violence throughout Greece. It is a, what seems to be a never ending struggle. The Greeks fighting for their independence, the Ottomans fighting to hold on. Well, what does that have to do with Russia? Well, who is Russia's traditional enemy? The Ottoman Turks. And who, are the Russians co-religionists, have a similar religion to them, the Greeks. The Greeks are Eastern Orthodox, the Russians are Eastern Orthodox, um, and neither one of them likes the Turks. So, what happens? Well, the new czar of Russia, Nicholas I, who succeeds Alexander, um, decides 
I see a way that I can strengthen my geopolitical position. I see a way to weaken the Ottoman Empire while creating ties with these other Orthodox uh, Christians. So what does Nicholas decide to do? Well, what's the default thing that the Russians do in the 19th century? He goes to war with the Turks. Uh, ostensibly, this war is to assist the Greeks in gaining their independence. But practically, it is a move to weaken the Ottoman Empire. Now, the question of a monarch, an emperor, supporting a revolution against another emperor is a very touchy one, right? Because you don't necessarily want subject peoples to revolt. You don't want subject peoples to take up arms against their conquerors. That's bad business if you're an emperor. But if you can weaken your traditional enemy, that's good. Um, but, you know, the Russians don't necessarily want to encourage nationalism within their own empire. They don't want the Turks or the Ukrainians or the Latvians to take up arms. That just becomes a big headache, but they want to weaken the Ottomans. So Nicholas does support the, uh, the Greeks in this war, defeats the Ottoman Turks, and eventually in 1831 or thereabouts, the Greeks do gain their independence and establish the modern nation of Greece. The Ottoman Empire has lost some territory. Russia's position, Russia's uh, prestige is growing because of that backing. Now, the fact that Russia, Russian prestige is growing is a little bit troublesome for Austria and Prussia and England and France. Because nobody really wants to see Russia get too powerful. Russia is immense. Russia has infinite resources. Uh, but Russia is kind of technologically trailing behind these other countries, and nobody really wants to see Russia gain more power. That's bad for everybody else. So, though Russia gains position in this war, there is still, you know, the other powers are very suspicious of what Russia is doing. While the Greeks are fighting for their independence, over in another part of the world, a, another imperial struggle begins to take shape. Over here in Central Asia, you have four empires abutting one another. The Russian Empire, here in blue, the Chinese Empire, in purple, the Persian Empire, and the British Empire. Britain at this time controls India. Now, the question that emerges, the, the problem that emerges, is who is going to be dominant in these relationships, and what about these buffer areas that kind of abut all four? Uh, this area here in yellow. What is that today? Pakistan. Uh, it's actually more yeah. Afghanistan. Pakistan is more down over here. Afghanistan. Afghanistan was kind of the middle area where all four of these empires ran into each other. Now, uh, no one empire ruled over Afghanistan, yet all four of them were trying to influence Afghanistan. Of these four, the most powerful were the British over here and the Russians over here. Now, for Britain, as they are creating their empire in the 19th century, the most important possession, the grandest part of their empire, was India. Most of their imperial wealth came from India. The British would go through to great lengths to protect India. And who was the immediate threat in the 1830s to India but expansionist imperial Russia? So the British are here feeling a threat from the north, from Russia. So Britain makes it a policy that they have to defend India, they have to defend it against Russian influence and Russian aggression. And where is the battlefield for this going to end up being? Crimea. Not, not yet in the Crimea. We get there eventually. Okay. But here in Afghanistan. Now, the Russians were trying to exert influence on the rulers of Afghanistan. The British were trying to exert influence on the rulers of Afghanistan. And the Afghanis, for their, their own part, wanted nothing to do with either side. They were fiercely independent. They still are fiercely independent. Don't want to be dominated by outsiders. So they are playing the game. They are playing both sides off against each other. Eventually, in the 1830s, uh, in 1839, 
The British decide, well, we need to protect India. We're going to invade Afghanistan to drive the Russian influence out and to uh, protect our interests. So a large British army invades Afghanistan. Uh, the first Anglo-Afghan war is sometimes called the Great Defeat. Because what happens to the British? Uh, th it doesn't go well for them. Um, they do manage to capture Kabul, the uh, sort of capital of Afghanistan, the important city in Afghanistan. But they have a hard time holding on to it. And when the British troops evacuate Kabul, as they are passing through the mountains back into India, many of them are slaughtered. In fact, there were only a handful of survivors from the British army that evacuated Kabul that actually made it back to British India. Uh, one of them was a, uh, a British doctor, a military doctor, who somehow survives the massacre of the British troops here in the mountains and makes it to, uh, to safety in British India. The British effort to take Afghanistan in the first Anglo-Afghan war fails miserably. So Afghanistan is still kind of in play. It's still that dangerous buffer area between Russia and Britain and the um, Ottoman Empire, excuse me, the Persian Empire. The British are still concerned about Afghanistan, still very much concerned about India, but their attention soon gets drawn a little bit westward to the Crimea. The Crimean Peninsula that Russia had acquired under Catherine the Great becomes the uh, location of one of the dramatic wars of the 19th century, the Crimean War. Now, why was the Crimean War fought? What was the cause of this Crimean War? The causes were multi-layered. I mean, you had imperial competition between the Ottoman Turks and the Russian Empire. The British kind of supported the Ottomans against the expansion of the Russians to play that balance of power thing. And you have France. Now, what does France have to do with this? France, in 1852... Um, by the time we get to 1852, France has gone through monarchy, the restored monarchy. That monarchy is overthrown in 1848. The Second French Republic is established in 1848. And a guy named Louis Napoleon Bonaparte is the president of the Second French Republic. In 1852, he overthrows the Republic and establishes the Second French Empire and rules over France as the Emperor Napoleon III. Now, Napoleon III, a new emperor, wants to begin exerting his influence in international affairs. So he begins putting pressure on the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire because Napoleon III wants the largely honorary title of being protector of the Christian pilgrims in the Holy Land. The Holy Land, Israel, Lebanon, is part of the Ottoman Empire. And uh, earlier... That title, that honorary title of protector of Christian pilgrims, pilgrims in the Holy Land, had been granted to the Russian Tsar. Well, now Napoleon wants that title. He puts diplomatic pressure on the, the Sultan. The Sultan doesn't really care and says, fine, you can now be the protector of the Christian pilgrims in the Holy Land. That, of course, uh, upsets the Tsar, who sees this as a mortal insult. How dare you take that esteemed title away from me and give it to this, this upstart in France? So what does the Russian Tsar do in response? But he invades, he and his army, invade um, Ottoman territory over here in Eastern Europe. And they basically take a bunch of land from the Ottoman Turks. Well, the Ottoman Turks are very upset by this. And they turn to Britain for help. Remember, if Russia becomes bigger and more powerful, that's bad for Britain and that balance of power. So Britain and France ally themselves with the Ottomans to wage war against Russia. And they launch an invasion of the Crimea over here in the Black Sea. Kind of a long story to get to a war that really doesn't change the geopolitical situation. In the end, Russia is defeated by this alliance against them. Um, they are forced to give back the territory that they had stolen or taken from the Ottoman Turks in Europe, uh, and the British and the French go back to Europe. Basically, Russia had a, its hand slapped. 
as a result. Now, one of the important things about the Crimean War is that it's really one of the first modern wars. In that it is during the Crimean War we see the early effects of industrialization. Uh, the equipment that was being used, the weapons that were being used were much more powerful and much more accurate than had, than had been used during the Napoleonic War. Really the first previous European war. The generals and the tactics, however, had not evolved. They were still fighting the war with Napoleonic tactics. And in fact, the British soldiers who go to the Crimea are wearing the same uniforms, same style uniforms, that they had worn at the Battle of Waterloo 40 years previous. They were in the Crimea, where it gets very, very hot in the summertime, wearing bearskin hats and carrying full kits and wearing wool uniforms. The uh, casualty rate for the British and the French was extremely high. Part of that also had to do with the fact that the military hospitals uh, were not necessarily places you went to recover from wounds, but where you went to die from wounds. How many of you know the name Florence Nightingale? It's the Crimean War that makes Florence Nightingale's reputation. She goes to the Crimea, sees the horrible conditions in these military hospitals, and immediately begins cleaning them up. Um, you know, prior to her arrival, the wounded soldiers had been laying on piles of straw on the floor, infested with vermin, and there were rats and, and fleas and lice and that sort of thing. She goes and cleans out the hospitals. Um, oftentimes, if a soldier died in a bed, his body would be removed from the bed and a new wounded soldier would be put in that bed blood-soaked and, and full of gore. Um, she prevents that from happening. She forces the British military uh, doctors to use clean bandages in somewhat sterile conditions. And once she gets there and cleans up the military hospital, suddenly the survival rate for wounded British soldiers begins to increase dramatically. Uh, Florence Nightingale later goes on to co-found the International Red Cross. Another important thing of the Crimea is that it was the first war that was photographed. Uh, British photographers, Robert Fenton, for example, go out to the Crimea with their big equipment and take pictures of the battlefield, take pictures of the encampments, take pictures of the soldiers. No action shots, but certainly uh, you can see how the troops lived. And perhaps for those of you with a literary bent, it's during the Crimean War, the Battle of Balaclava, that the famous Charge of the Light Brigade occurs. Uh, the Light Brigade was a British cavalry unit that is mistakenly given orders to charge the Russian heavy guns at the top of a hill. 600 members of the Light Brigade charge into what comes to be called the Valley of Death, surrounded by Russian cannons. The Russian cannons are firing into where the, uh, the troops are charging up the hill. The Light Brigade, <laughs> its charge is successful. 200 of them make it to the Russian lines and make it back. But 400 of those Light Brigade Troops never survive. They don't make it through the battle. The Russians, for their part, were in awe of the Light Brigade, of this charge, a suicidal charge. Yet the discipline, the courage of the British troops, the Russians, when the, the Light Brigade gets to the top of the hill, were, were shocked. How could the British military do this? Uh, the discipline, the professionalism, but the sacrifice surprised everybody. But it was a futile charge. It was a costly charge that really didn't achieve anything. And it was later memorialized by Alfred Lord Tennyson in the famous poem, The Charge of the Light Brigade. We don't, it's a long poem. This is just the first uh, stanza of it over here. In any case, uh, the Crimean War ends with a Russian defeat, Russian hands being slapped, as I said. But that doesn't stop Russian attempts at growth. Uh, Nicholas I dies in 1855 just as the Crimean War is kind of reaching its pinnacle. And he's succeeded by his son, Alexander II. Alexander II was, in many ways, a liberal czar, uh, in that he wanted to reform Russia politically and socially. It's during his reign that the serfs in Russia are freed. He ends serfdom. Now, what is a serf? Slave. It's kind of like a slave, but not really, because serfs weren't owned but they were tied to the land. If you were a serf, you could only live in this parcel of land. Now, whoever owned the land, the serfs came along with it. Uh, so it was kind of like slavery, but not exactly like slavery. Um, Alexander 
and serfdom in Russia. He essentially says, all of you people who were tied to the land now can not be tied to the land. Of course, what did those people know how to do? But be farmers, be peasants on the land. So though legally it changes their status, uh, practically it takes a while before that reform is implemented. There was also talk that around 1880, 1881, Alexander II was thinking of writing a constitution for Russia. Russia did not have a written constitution. The czars were absolute monarchs. They were autocrats. They could do as they pleased, and what the czar said was law. Uh, the rights of the citizens essentially didn't exist. Alexander was thinking of creating a written constitution, limiting the power of the czar, creating a, or implementing a perhaps elected legislative assembly, or at least advisory assembly, uh, that never happens because Alexander's assassinated in 1881. But it's during the reign of Alexander that we see tensions increasing between Russia and another one of its regional rivals, the Austro-Hungarian Empire. The Austro-Hungarian Empire is reformed in 1848, and the emperor of this empire is Franz Joseph. He will be emperor until the First World War. He dies in 1916. So he's emperor of Austria-Hungary for almost 70 years. Uh, he's there for a long, long time. The Austro-Hungarian Empire was a massive land-based empire right here in South Central Europe. Uh, it abutted the German Empire, which was created in 1871. It abutted uh, some newly independent states here in the Balkans and the Ottoman Empire, and it had territorial uh, tensions with the Russian Empire. So under the reign of Alexander II and the Emperor Franz Joseph, we see the Russians and the Austrians becoming territorial rivals, while still dealing with the Ottomans down over here. So Russia is getting very much involved in these Western politics, in these, these issues. And what becomes the main theater of the conflict between Austria, Russia, and the Ottoman Empire? But the Balkans. The area uh, in southeastern Europe. Greece over here has gained its independence. In 1835, the Ottoman Empire stretched all the way up here to Habsburg, Austria, the Austrian Empire, and Russia. Uh, as we've seen, Russia is kind of extended its uh, influence a little bit this way. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> oh, that snuck up on me. Um, and the Austrians are beginning to push this way also into the Balkans. So the Russians want to extend their influence into the Balkans. The Austrians want to extend their influence into the Balkans. And the Turks want to maintain their influence in the Balkans. Three empires that are going to collide in this area of Europe. Well, as it happens, um, Russia and Austria do begin to expand into the Balkans. The Ottomans, by the 19th century, are a weakened empire, and they are gradually losing territory in Southeast Europe. In fact, in 1877, Russia and Turkey go to war again over territory in the Balkans. And Russia, once again, wins this war, Turkey is forced to make territorial concessions. The Russian Empire is successful and expanding. Now, what do we know the other powers in Europe think when Russia begins to grow? They go, uh-oh, that's not good for us. Here's actually a fascinating photograph of Russian troops in the field during that Russo-Turkish War in 1878. So you can see what the uh, Russian military uniforms looked like. And they're somewhere in the Balkans here. I don't read Russian, so I can't tell you where. But I can read the date there. Um, in any case, so Russia is expanding, and that frightens the other European nations. So in 1878, a meeting is held in Berlin, the Congress of Berlin. And the point of the Congress of Berlin was to decide what do we do with the Balkans? How do we reconfigure the boundaries there to protect the interests of the Ottomans, contain the Russians, and make the Austrians happy? It was essentially a diplomatic attempt to solve the Balkan crisis. 
uh, the problems of the Balkans. You have some important figures that are there. This is Otto von Bismarck, the uh, Premier of Germ Prime Minister of Germany. This is uh, Benjamin Disraeli, the Prime Minister of Great Britain. All of the great powers were represented trying to diplomatically solve the issue of the Balkans, which everybody could see was going to be a point of conflict. If there was going to be another European war, it was probably going to start in the Balkans. By 1878, everybody realized that. So the diplomats in Europe were trying to prevent that. We're trying to solve the problem before it exploded into a war. Um, it doesn't really work out, as we'll see. In the meantime, the British are concerned about Russian meddling in Afghanistan. Uh, in fact, the British had tried to send an ambassador from British India to uh, Kabul in Afghanistan. And that ambassador was rebuffed. He was not allowed to come in. Short time afterward, the Russians do send an ambassador to Afghanistan. And the British say, uh-oh, Russia's gaining influence. Russia's gaining power in Afghanistan, and that threatens India. So what do the British do? They invade Afghanistan once again. Um, slightly more successful than the first time they invaded. They do manage to overthrow the monarch of Afghanistan and install a friendly ruler there, but it is a costly effort and a messy effort that doesn't really uh, achieve the desired results. Britain has a little bit more influence in Afghanistan, but it doesn't really protect India all that much. Now, the thing about the Afghan wars that the British fight is that Russia really had no interest in trying to put direct pressure on British India, because the Russians would have had to go through Afghanistan to do so. And the Russians realized that's probably not a good idea. But the British were so scared of the Russian threat that they continuously undertake these military expeditions into Afghanistan. <clears throat> now, as I mentioned, the Tsar Alexander II is assassinated in 1881 uh, by an anarchist in St. Petersburg. A bomb goes off underneath his carriage and he dies in the streets. He's succeeded by his son, Alexander III. Alexander III was unlike his father in that while his father had reforming tendencies, Alexander III did not. The one rule that he lived by was that he was the autocrat of Russia. He was the power in Russia, and that's the way God had ordained it, and nobody could change that. So in a lot of ways, he was the uh, counterbalance to what his father was doing. That idea of a constitution for Russia doesn't exist under Alexander III. Now, interestingly, Alexander III um, marries a Danish princess um, who has a sister who marries the Prince of Wales in England. So Alexander III and the Prince of Wales are now in-laws. The family relationship gets more complicated, and we'll move forward with that in a little bit. Uh, now, the relationship between Alexander III and the West was um, antagonistic at best. The threat of German expansion was a constant threat to Russian security in the area of Poland. Who else was threatened by the, the idea of German expansion, however? But France. In 1871, France loses a war to Prussia that precipitates the creation of the German Empire. So the French don't like the Germans, the Russians don't like the Germans, the French and the Russians don't necessarily like each other, but they have a common enemy. So what happens? Uh, beginning with diplomacy in um, 1891, going until 1893, but the French and the Russians begin to form an alliance. And in 1894, that alliance is formalized. It's called the Franco-Russian Alliance or the Russo-French Alliance. Uh, Basically, what they promise to do is that if Germany attacks either one of them, the other country would come to the defense of the attacked party. So if Germany attacks Russia, France would come to the defense of Russia. If Germany attacks France, Russia would come to the defense of France. The threat of German expansion and German military power caused this alliance. 
and it's alliance that, an alliance that would last until 1917, well into the First World War. It's actually one of the things that caused the First World War when we look at it in a bigger picture. Alexander I, uh, excuse me, Alexander III has a son who is his heir, a kid named Nicholas. Uh, but Alexander doesn't really think that Nicholas isn't, is ready to be taught how to be a czar. So he kind of keeps putting it off and putting it off. And he finally comes up with this plan. He says, when Nicholas turns 30, I'll start teaching him how to be a czar. Teach him about statecraft and diplomacy and all that sort of thing. There's one flaw in Alexander's plan. That flaw is that he dies before Nicholas is 30. So, in 1894, Nicholas becomes the Tsar of Russia with very little training in how to actually be the Tsar of Russia. The one lesson he learned from his father is that as Tsar, he is God's anointed. He is the autocrat, the only ruler in Russia. Of course, uh, Nicholas's reign would end in tragedy for him, he and his family. Um, revolution will end the Romanov dynasty. Now, Nicholas uh, falls in love with a granddaughter of Queen Victoria's, who he ends up marrying. Her name is Alexandra. Now, let's think about Nicholas for the second. His father marries a Danish princess whose sister marries the Prince of Wales. The Prince of Wales becomes King of England in 1901. So Nicholas's uncle is now the King of England. Who's Nicholas's uncle, who was the son of Queen Victoria, is now the King of England. Nicholas's wife was the granddaughter of Queen Victoria, the niece of the King of England. Uh, one of the other grandsons of Queen Victoria is a guy named Wilhelm. William, he's the emperor of Germany. So by 1901, when Queen Victoria dies, two of her grandchildren are emperors, the emperor of Russia, the emperor of Germany, and her son is the king of Great Britain and emperor of India. Now, Edward VII will reign until 1910. He dies and is succeeded by his son, who becomes King George V. George and Wilhelm are first cousins. George and Nicholas are first cousins. So, in 1910, three of the most powerful states in Europe, Russia, Germany, and Great Britain, are ruled by first cousins. Not to complicate matters for you. Um, so in any case, Nicholas II becomes Tsar of Russia in 1894. Now, Nicholas has very close ties to the West, has very close ties to England and Germany, family ties to both of those places. And what we see happening in the early 20th century, late 19th, early 20th century, is that in many cases, the interests of the West take precedence, and the Russians work with other European nations. Um, one place where we see that happening is in China. By the 1890s, uh, Western powers, the United States, the European powers, and even Japan, had begun making inroads into China. For centuries, China had closed its off, itself off to the West. But in the, later, 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 <laughs> in the later part of the 19th century, the West begins to push into China. The Chinese government is weak. The Chinese military is weak. So the Westerners push deeper and deeper into China, start getting more and more involved in China. Well, certain aspects of Chinese society didn't like that. They saw the West as a threat and undermining Chinese culture and Chinese civilization. So in 1899, a rebellion breaks out, an anti-Western rebellion. It comes to be called the Boxer Rebellion because the members of this movement against the West practiced martial arts. They practiced martial arts, which they believed made them impervious to Western bullets, that they could not be killed by bullets uh, fired from Western guns. That doesn't work out for them. But um, they basically start attacking Western diplomats and Western missionaries and Western merchants throughout China. 
The Chinese government is really powerless to put down this rebellion and doesn't really want to put down this rebellion. So what happens is the Western powers and Japan form an alliance and they invade China to put down the Boxer Rebellion. Among this alliance are Russian troops. And here we see Russian troops in China. Now remember that Russia and China had long had a fraught relationship. They were competing for influence in Central Asia. Now, after the Boxer Rebellion, China is essentially, um, the Chinese Empire is essentially on its deathbed. And in fact, by 1911, the Chinese Empire itself will collapse. The last emperor is sent into exile and a Chinese Republic is established. So the Boxer Rebellion was essentially the last gasp of China to maintain its empire. And it is crushed by an alliance of Western powers that included the Russians. Uh, this cartoon, a French cartoon, shows China being divided up among the Western imperial powers. The British, the Germans, the Russians, the French, and even the Japanese. While the, the Manchu Chinese guy in the background is powerless to stop the pie from being divided up. So... By the time of the Boxer Rebellion, there seems to be a harmony among the Western powers, Russia and Europe. They seem to be getting along. They still have territorial interests, there's still tension, but they seem to be working together at least against China. Well, a couple of, couple of years later, the partnership that had existed during the Boxer Rebellion is completely dismantled. Russia and Japan... Japan, which is a growing empire, an emergent empire at this point, have territorial conflict in East Asia. The Russians claim some islands, the Japanese claim those islands. Well, how do we settle this dispute? Logically, we go to war. Now, when the Russo-Japanese War starts in 1904, everybody thinks it's going to be a one-sided war. Russia's going to win, as you see over here. The Russian battleship punch punching the Japanese battleship in the face. There's no way that Japan... This upstart nation, a tiny little country, could possibly face up to the might of the, the Russian Empire. Well, the pundits were right in one sense. It really was a one-sided war. But it was the Japanese who dismantle the Russian military, who embarrass the Russian military. They destroy two Russian fleets, capture territory, in Russia. Russia is forced to sue for peace. And in 1905, a peace treaty is hammered out in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt mediating between the Japanese and uh, Russian empires. And the Treaty of Portsmouth ends the Russo-Japanese War. Now for his efforts, Teddy Roosevelt wins the Nobel Peace Prize. He's the first American to win that peace prize. We don't need to go into the Nobel Peace Prize, as it's been in the news lately. But in any case, um, the Russo-Japanese War is an embarrassment for Russia. It's an embarrassment for Nicholas II. And in fact, the defeat by the Japanese sparks a rebellion, a revolution in Russia. In 1905, there is a revolution where the people in Russia want more of a say in their government. And... Nicholas is forced to concede. He's forced to make concessions. He institutes the Imperial Russian Duma, which is essentially a uh, gathering of legislators who can pass law, but the Tsar doesn't necessarily need to implement those laws. So he implements the Duma. It's a, on the surface, a way of giving the people, certain aspects of the people, more say in how Russia is ruled. And it puts off a bigger revolution for about a decade or so. In any case, uh, this leads to tremendous turmoil in Russia itself. In the aftermath of the Russo-Japanese War, Russia is increasingly concerned about its periphery, what's going on in the territories around it. So in 1907, Britain and Russia reach an agreement. It's called the Anglo-Russian Convention. And it's an agreement about how the territory between the Russian Empire over here and the British Indian Empire over here will be dealt with. Basically, both sides agree to stop trying to take the other side's territory. Uh, in a way, they both concede that they have spheres of influence in the Persian Empire and the Russians say we're not going to invade India and the British say we're not going to invade Russia. It was kind of a way of 
diplomatically solving that problem of that, that middle ground between those two empires. While the Anglo-Russian convention settles some territorial questions, there is still the issue of the Balkans. What do we do in the Balkans over here? Much of this territory was still controlled by the Ottoman Empire. A couple of independent states had been carved out of there, out of the Ottoman Empire. But both Austria and Russia had claims, wanted to expand into that area. Well, as it happens, in 1908, there's a, a um, political situation in the Ottoman Empire. A revolution, or a, an attempted coup d'etat against the power of the Sultan. The Ottomans are occupied, preoccupied with these internal concerns, and that gives both Russia and Austria opportunity to meddle in the Balkans. So what happens when the Ottoman Turks are trying to maintain their authority is that the Austrians come in and annex Bosnia-Herzegovina over here. The Russians, in the meantime, uh, create and defend an independent Romania and make a play on Bulgaria. The Ottoman Turks are powerless to do anything. Now, the fact that the Austrians had moved into Bosnia-Herzegovina creates tension with the Kingdom of Serbia. The Serbs thought that they should be the dominant power over here, and they had their eyes on Bosnia-Herzegovina. Once the Austrians moved in, that increased the tension between the Serbs and the Austrians. Now, why is that significant? Well, the Serbs were allies of the Russians. The Serbs and the Russians were both Slavic people. The Russians saw themselves as the defenders of all the Slavs. So Serbia and Russia were in the same orbit. The Austrians, those territorial rivals. So the Balkans start to become very, very fraught and very, very much filled with tension. But the lid is kept on that tension. The lid is kept on the possible outbreak of war there until this guy comes along. Franz Ferdinand, Archduke of the Austrian Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, heir presumptive to the Austrian throne. He was Franz Joseph's, uh, Franz Joseph's nephew. He was the next emperor. Now, why is that a big deal? Well, in 1914, the Austrian military was holding their annual maneuvers, their annual war games, outside of Sarajevo in Bosnia-Herzegovina, right on the border of Serbia. And Franz Ferdinand was the inspector general of the Austrian military. So he was there watching the war games, watching the exercises conducted by the Austrian military. The problem is that the Serbs knew he was there. And the Serbs figured, well, we're going to teach Austria a lesson. So what happens to Franz Ferdinand and his wife on June 28, 1914? They are assassinated. And that assassination would be the spark that would ignite the First World War. All of those tensions that had been building up between the Russians and the Turks and the Austrians and the Russians and the Serbs and the Austrians and the Germans and everybody um, explode with the assassination of the Archduke in the spring of 1914. Uh, two months of diplomacy follow the assassination. The Austrians try to get the Serbs to, uh, to make concessions, to make amends. The Serbs say, we're not going to do that and we have Russia backing us. The Austrians turn to Germany and say, hey, uh, if we attack Serbia, are you going to help us out? And the Germans say, sure, do what you need to do. Um, when Germany promises to defend, to back Austria, it essentially causes Russia um, to call on France, by the terms of their alliance, to try to keep Germany in check. And diplomacy ends up failing. The Austrians invade Serbia, the Russians declare war on Austria, the Germans declare war on Russia, and the French declare war on Germany, and just like that, all of Europe descends into the chaos of the First World War. A war which nobody thought was going to be a very long war. The Germans expected to be in Paris within weeks of the start of the hostilities. The French expected to be in Berlin for Christmas. Nobody thought the war was going to drag on or cost 15 million lives or whatever. 
uh, but everybody was wrong. Now the turmoil of the First World War leads to political turmoil in Russia. And in fact, in 1917, a revolution breaks out that topples the Romanov dynasty. The emperor, the Tsar, is forced to abdicate in March of 1917. He becomes a prisoner of the provisional government, which is headed by a guy named Alexander Kerensky, over here. Kerensky, the new leader of Russia, decides to um, respect the treaty obligations, the alliances he has, continues fighting the war against Germany. That makes the Russian people unhappy, and they turn to somebody even more radical, uh, Vladimir Lenin who shows up in Russia in April of 1917 and incites the Bolshevik Revolution, essentially taking down the uh, provisional government and eventually leading to the execution of Nicholas II and his family in a small uh, town, Ural Mountain town, called Ekaterinburg. Now, the rise of Lenin, the downfall of the Romanovs, the civil war that breaks out in Russia, causes profound concern for the rest of Europe, for the rest of the West. And in fact, what happens? The Allies invade Russia. Between 1918 and 1925, uh, there are foreign armies stationed in Russia. Uh, the United States sends troops to Russia in 1918. We have troops in Russia until 1922. Now, why do Britain, France, the United States, and Japan send troops to Russia in the midst of the Russian Civil War? Ostensibly, it was to protect the equipment that had been given to the Russian Empire to fight the war. Remember, the Tsar was the ally of Britain and France and the United States. And we had been sending equipment to Russia to be used in fighting the war. When the Tsar's regime collapses and Russia pulls out of the war, the Allies wanted their equipment back, basically. So we send troops to Russia. These here are American troops at Archangel Russia in the far north, above the Arctic Circle. They spend a miserable year in Archangel and Murmansk. They get frozen in. They can't come home. Other American troops are stationed in Vladivostok, in the far east of Russia. Basically, until the end of the Russian Civil War, around 1922, 1925, there are foreign troops stationed in Russia. When the Civil War comes to an end, the Soviet Union is established, those foreign troops are removed, and the relationship between Russia and the West changes. And it will remain changed over the course of the 20th century. So that, yeah, was a uh, <laughs> quick history of the relationship between Russia and the West from the, eight, the 1790s to the early 20th century. And that relationship kind of feeds into a lot of what's going on in the relationship between Russia and the West today. So does anybody have any questions? Yes. Um, I, I know uh, when Catherine's son Paul mm -hmm. was succeeded by Alexander, Yes. I couldn't figure out what was his claim to the throne, because that seems to be where the imperial um, succession started. What was Alexander's claim to the throne? He was a cousin, I believe. So it was a family member. I can't remember the exact relationship there. But he was a Romanov who succeeds to the throne and continues the Romanov line down. I will add, too, that I appreciate you doing all of this without notes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Yes. Where? Uh, Bridgewater State. Most of the time at Bridgewater State. Very interesting. Yes. Just tell us how briefly how this affects today. How does this affect today? What is the relationship between Russia and the United States today? Are you Russia and the West today? <laughs> there, there's a little bit, a little bit of tension, right? Um, it's tension that is a legacy of the Cold War, which we all remember, but it's also a legacy of tension that emerges out of this that idea of competition between Russia and the West, that idea of not letting Russia get too powerful because a powerful Russia is a threat to the interests of Europe. And you can only, I mean, all you have to do is look at what Russia has been doing in the last 
decade or so, you know, um, invading the Crimea, uh, invading the Ukraine, using its natural resources to put pressure on many states in Eastern Europe, Belarus and Poland and, and all of those countries. Um, in many ways, the Russian government today is trying to reestablish the Iron Curtain of the Cold War, sort of, but the Iron Curtain was formed as a his, kind of off of the history of Russian expansion into Eastern Europe during the period of Russian, the Russian Empire. So it all kind of follows along in a, a linear fashion. Any other questions? Well, when did Stalin uh, begin his... Stalin emerges as the leader of the Soviet Union in 1925, I want to say. Uh, he stays in power until 1953 in his, his death. March 5th. It was when he died. <laughs> March 6th. Um, so, it, you know, Stalin's there for a very, very long time. And it's really Stalin who creates the Soviet Union as we think of it. Um, Lenin wasn't around long enough. Lenin was kind of the ideological leader. He used his own brutality. He had his own, you know, he had Stalin eliminating people for him. But it's really the Soviet Union, as we think of it in the Cold War context, emerges under Stalin. And is Hitler getting started in the midst of all of this? Um, Hitler fights in the First World War and emerges, gets involved with the, uh, the National Socialist Party, the Nazi Party, in the 1920s. He doesn't emerge as the leader of Germany until 1933. So a lot of this stuff is happening in the background. Now here's kind of an interesting side note, and then I'll stop talking because I went way over my time. Um, when we teach American history, we talk about early American history and the European explorers of North America, we never mention the Russians. Yet Russians were very much a part of the, um, the exploration of the, the Northwest, the Pacific Northwest. In fact, when the United States purchases Alaska in 1867, who is it purchased from? Russia. It's purchased Seward's from Russia. Folly. Seward's Folly. Exactly. And even as far south as Northern California, there were Russian trade outposts and there are Russian Orthodox churches that were built along the coast because of the Russian presence in the uh, Pacific Northwest. It's kind of another tie-in to the uh, relationship between Russia and the West. So, that's all I got. So, thanks for coming out. <laughs>